it's broken up into selections of eight verses each. Each selection begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, when it's translated from Hebrew to English, you lose all this ability to see the letters showing up. But at the beginning of each section is a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So this morning's section begins with the letter He. Uh, if you were to be able to read this in Hebrew, each of the lines would begin with the letter He. This was their way of rhyming. This was an A to memorizing. So if you were a child going to Hebrew school at the temple, you would have been expected to memorize Psalm 119. All 176 verses, yes. But they had a trick built in. Each eight verses began with a letter, and in my, their mind, there was a rhythm. And it's like me giving you something to memorize that begins with A, B, C, D, E. That was how they memorized it. Right, so this section, we'll do four sections, four letters. So if you're good at math, that means we'll do 32 verses this morning. So starting in verse 57 and 58. You are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your words. Now, as the psalmist speaks these words, uh, the best way to describe the guy speaking these words is a guy with a satisfied soul. Psalmist is satisfied with what he has received from the Lord. He is not only satisfied, he is thankful. He is grateful for what God has done in his life. Psalmist then says, I have said that I would keep your words. This promise would be an empty vow for the psalmist or for any of us unless God gave us the ability to keep that promise. We make all kinds of promises. We have good intentions as we make these promises. But you know what? We don't have the ability to keep them. It sounds good. We feel good when we say it. But without God's help, we can't do it. Thomas says, I have entreated. I, that's a word you haven't used in a sentence this week. I have pleaded. I have asked strongly. Your favor with my whole heart. Thomas understood the urgency to both seek and please God and his complete inability to do so unless God helped him. We are in the same situation. We can't do these things without God's help. Now, every now and then, I try to give you some, some flavor, some background to the words. So when you read that part about, I entreated your favor. Okay. I use the word favor, and you know what I'm talking about. Let's go back into the Hebrew mind. That would have probably been more literally translated instead of favor as your face. He was seeking God's face. He wanted to know that God was looking at him. He wanted to know that God was noticing him. That God was aware of him. That's what he's talking about when he says, your favor. He sought the face of God with a sense of urgency. He used words like entreated, whole heart. The psalmist understood how important it was to seek the favor of God and to please him with his life. He then says, be merciful to me according to your word. The request for mercy is not based on being right. It's not based on the fact that the psalmist deserves it. He's asking for it because God promised it. And he's believing God's promise. Uh, Miss Victoria, read a verse. Somewhat surprised that it works. We need to trust what God says to us. We need to be able to put our confidence in it. We need to know that it works when everything is going wrong around us. God loves us. Again, I, I say this often. I believe this with all my heart. If you leave here with nothing else this morning, 
if you don't remember anything else I said, remember that God loves you. God cares about you. God is not mad at you. God is not unhappy with you. God is not disappointed in you. God does not work in guilt trips. Mothers work in guilt trips. That's not how God does things. God does things through his love for us, and he loves us. All right, verses 59 and 60. This is deep. I, I'm going to read over this. You're going to say, yeah, that's nice, but this is deep. I want you to get this. I thought about my ways, and I turned my feet to your testimony. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. So he spent time thinking about who he was and what he had done in his life. And you know what? He came up with the conclusion, boy, I haven't done what God wanted me to do. Guess what? That's true of all of us. Remember I told you how much God loves you? God loves you in spite of you. Isn't that a neat thought? Amen. God loves me in spite of me, and boy, am I glad he does. God loves you in spite of you. But he thought about his ways. Uh, this verse has been referred to as the turning point of man's character and destiny. This means that it's vital for every person to consider his or her ways, understand that our way, get this folks, understand that our ways are destructive and will lead us to destruction and then make an about face when we're going one way and we change our direction and we go the other way, God's way. That's what we call repentance. We sang a song about that this morning. We repent. We go in God's way. It says he made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. Once he got his heart right with God, it was easier to do the things God wanted him to do. Uh, I spend a lot of time, as it was noted this morning, encouraging you to read your Bible. Now, that's hard for some people. Some people say, I can't do that. I dread the thought of that. I would suggest that's because you haven't fallen in love with the author of the book. This is a book from God to us as individuals. God wants us to read it and learn it and understand it. And it is understandable. Verses 61 and 62. The cords of the wicked have bound me but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgment. Now, we don't know for sure. We suspect that this psalm was written by David. Uh, David had a very roller coaster life, if you've studied David. David was way up on the mountain. David was way down in the valley. David was up praising God. David was down sinning. So David had a roller coaster life, and many of the low points on that roller coaster ride of David's life was when the enemies were out to kill him, out to take his throne, out to take his city, out to put his people in slavery. So David had lots of enemies. So he is talking about that here. The cords of the wicked have bound me. I've, I've got troubles. I get distressed. God, you don't know what's going on. Actually, he does. Please don't ever tell God he doesn't know what's going on. He does. We don't understand that. We don't internalize that some days. But God knows what's going on. Okay, and because of that, no matter what went wrong, David stayed in a right relationship with God. Now, did David stumble? Yep. David do stupid stuff. Yep. Do we stumble? Do we do stupid stuff? But God loves us and God forgives us. Now, this so troubled David's heart that he had trouble sleeping. All right? At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you. 
because of your righteous judgments. So David tossed and turned and prayed and got up and prayed and got his heart right with God. All right? When you can't sleep at night, consider asking God if there's something you need to fix. If there's something God wants to deal with you about. If there's something God wants you to talk to him about. All right, verses 63 and 64. I am a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O oh Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. The writer of the psalm enjoyed a special fellowship, a special companionship among those people who felt the same way about God as he did. Now, we sometimes, you know, want to have a pity party and think, oh, the world is terrible. I'm the only one left that loves God. There's always somebody else left that loves God. And if we can find them, we can fellowship with them. We can gain strength from them. We can give them strength. We can work together, okay? We want to look for people who are lovers of God, like we are, so that we can have fellowship with them. Then he makes this observation. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Having experienced this fellowship with other Christians, Samus felt the goodness of God. This experience of God's mercy increased his desire for knowledge and obedience. That's why he ends that section with, Teach me your statutes. Now, this is a picture of what should be a never-ending cycle in our life. As we pursue God, and we do it through his word, that will lead us to satisfaction and blessing. That satisfaction and blessing should lead to a deeper pursuit, spending more time with God, getting to know God better, being more hungry for God's word, which will lead to more satisfaction and blessing. And this just keeps going and going as we fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus. Amen. If it's not working like that, I would suggest to you the problem is not God's. <laughs> God's hardly ever wrong. Never. So I would suspect if there's a problem, it's us. So if we don't feel close to God, if we don't have a hunger to read God's word, if we don't have a desire to be with God's people, that's a tip off that there's something wrong that we need to fix. The way we fix it is repent. My favorite our word. All right, the next section begins with the letter Tet. This is gonna talk about God's word bringing benefit from times of affliction. By the way, if you've been to a church that told you, just come to Jesus and everything will be okay, they lied to you. Coming to Jesus does not make everything okay. Uh, my version of that story is, come to Jesus and get a target painted on your back. Because once you declare your love for Jesus, the enemy who never bothered you before, the enemy who never cared about you before, the enemy who never considered you a threat before now wants to destroy you because you're now going in the direction God wants you to go. Now, what do we know? We know that the devil can't kill you. He's not allowed to. Okay. All right? We know that once you're saved, nothing can take that away from you. Jesus said, I give him life and no one pluck them out of my father's hands. So if you've been saved, you can't lose that. You can't have it taken away from you. So the devil can't kill you and the devil can't take away your salvation. What's he got left? He's going to make your life miserable and he's going to try to keep you from taking anybody to heaven with you. That's his tactics. Now, the Bible tells us we're not ignorant of his tactics. We understand what he's doing. Egypt, we get so busy sometimes we forget and the minute we start looking up there and start looking here we get messed up so let's be very careful all right 
verses 65 and 66. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Now, this is practical, step-by-step, how to do life with God's help. First of all, whoever wrote this, again, I'm assuming it's David, but I can't prove it. Whoever wrote this says, you have dealt well with your servant. He understood what his role was. He was the servant. He was not the boss. You know what the problem with us is as people? We want to be the boss. We want to have the power. We want to make the decisions. We would desperately like to believe we know best. Guess what? We don't. And every time I think I do, I fall flat on my face. So he tells God that everything that's happening is happening according to God's word. Now, if that's true, boy, we got to know God's word. It says, teach me good judgment and knowledge. All right, now, I know a crazy pastor who would like you to read a proverb every day. Why does he do that? Because it's how you learn good judgment and knowledge. Now, the book of Proverbs is this book full of sayings that have moral value. So as you read the Proverbs every day and you learn about the fact that what, the ant's going to have food because the ant works. Talks about not being lazy. Talks about how to treat your neighbor. Talks about don't hang around in your neighbor's house too much. Talks about don't gossip. I mean, it's all these things we need to incorporate into our life. Well, if I get you to read that 12 times a year, it ought to start to get into here and get into here so that before something comes out of here, I'm filtering it through God's instructions on how to do what. And you know what? If I do that, less hurtful less dumb troublemaking stuff comes out of my mouth. Because left to my own, I'll say things that will upset you. By the way, we got some new folks here. I'm glad you're here. If I haven't offended you yet, give me time. <laughs> I will. Okay, it's inevitable. Count on it. I won't let you down. You get to practice forgiveness. Yeah, you can learn how to forgive me. I need lots of it. Amen. Thank you. Uh, and he says, well, I believe your commandments. You can't believe the commandments unless you know the commandments. How do I know what God wants me to do? I read his word. I read his instruction book. I did not come up with this. I take no credit for it. Like most things I do, I stole it somewhere else. But this is your Bible. B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Please get it right. You don't get a do-over. Get it right the first time. All right. Verses 66 and 67. These are not fun verses. Before I was afflicted. Doesn't even sound like a good word, does it? Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. All right, so the psalmist is gonna talk here about the lessons he learned. How do we do it, folks? The hard way. All right, there was a time when he was far more likely to go astray from God's word and the wise life revealed in it. Yet after a season of affliction, think trials, think problems. My favorite way to describe it, and it's lost in this generation, is a trip to the woodshed. It's correction, it's punishment, it's God teaching me so I don't get into worse trouble. And he didn't complain about God correcting him. He thanked God for it. 
He said, you are good and do good. He felt that the correction he got was good for him. You know, nobody likes it when mom and dad corrected them. But it was good for us. It kept us out of trouble. It kept us from doing stupid things. My dad was not a particularly religious man, but he was a very smart man. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to tell the story here or not. You can. <laughs> you don't know the story. I don't think you've heard this one before. On my 16th birthday, my dad took me down to the workshop and said, son, there are two rules. You don't get arrested and you don't get a girl pregnant. He says, and when you do one of those two things, I will break one of your legs. <laughs> I never doubted for a minute that he would break one of my legs. Never. I was the only teenager that drove three miles below the speed limit in the 55 zone, just in case. He had my attention. God wants to get our attention. God loves us, but God still corrects us when we need it. Fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. I do not want God to have to correct me. I do not want God to have to get my attention. I want to be listening so close. Do you say something, Lord? I want to get it. I, I, I have that same respect for the Lord that I had for my dad. And I never doubted for one minute that he meant what he said. Not one bit. Right, why don't I tell that story? Verses 69 through 70. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease. I'm not a doctor, but that doesn't sound good. But I delight in your law. Now remember, David had enemies, if this was David writing this. The proud have forged a lie against me. In reading of the godly and humble character of the psalmist, it's almost shocking to hear that he has enemies who would carefully forge a lie against him. Yet he explains how this is possible. Because they are proud. They are no doubt convicted in conscience and spiteful of his humble, obedient, teachable life before God. They hated him. Because the better David acted, the closer David got to God, the more guilty they felt. David just made them look bad. David says, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. These guys are trying to kill him. They're trying to destroy him. They're trying to take the kingdom away. And David said, nothing is going to keep me from following God and doing what he said. Then they give a very graphic description. I can see a doctor using this in his office talking to somebody. Their heart is as fat as grease. Yeah. That sound healthy? Yeah. That sound like you're on your way to a heart attack? Yeah. That's, it was bad. Their fat heart was not good for their physical or spiritual health. It meant that their hearts were dull, insensitive, Drowning in luxury and excess. That sound like America? Mm -hmm. Drowning in luxury and excess? Go have two Big Macs and go back and talk to me. <laughs> in contrast, the psalmist found delight in the Word of God. When you get done doing your Bible reading, are you delighted? Or you're grumbling, I did this because the pastor said I had to do it. He might check on me. i got to do this. So let's get it over with. We ought to be happy. We ought to be joyous. We ought to be glad that we get to spend time with God. By the way, if you aren't, again, it's a good sign that you need to do something. All right. Verses 71 and 72. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. I'm glad God punished me. I'm glad God cared enough about me to do something. And he said that because I may learn of your statutes. The law of your mouth is better me 
better to me than thousands of coins of gold or silver. So here's your, here's your quiz show this morning. You go in the quiz show and there's a table set before you. And there's this pile of gold and silver. And there's God's word. They get to pick one. Don't tell me. You might disappoint me. Yeah. Don't tell me which one you may pick. So he repeated the idea from an earlier section, verse 67, about it was good that I've been corrected. Right? Whenever the Bible repeats something, it's trying to get our attention. Affliction brought under the wisdom and guidance of God's word did genuine good in his life. Now get this principle. By affliction, God separates the sin which he hates from the soul which he loves. Now, remember I told you God loves us. God is crazy about us. But as much as God loves us, God hates the sin we commit. God's got a problem. He wants to love us he wants to hate the sin. He has to punish the sin. He wants to love us. And the solution he came up with was sending Jesus Christ Amen. to die on the cross. Amen. To pay for my sin and your sin, which he hates, which separates us from God. And he paid that price so that we could have eternal life with him. It says, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands. I like that. Boy, that's a, not, not, not just some. Thousands of coins of gold and silver. I'm sure that was a bunch of money. Thousands of gold coins. And God's word, God's love is better than that. All right. The next section begins with the Hebrew letter Yod. Now, believe it or not, you know this one. You don't know that you know it, but you do. Do you remember Jesus telling you that heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one jot or one tittle will pass until the law is fulfilled? This is the jot. That's what it's referring to. If you were to look at anybody's foreign language written in their own language, Every now and then there's something that looks like a letter with a little dot or a little wavy character over it, something that changes the pronunciation. That's what this would be. It would be one of those little punctuation marks. Itty bitty little thing, but it changes the whole meaning. That's what this is. All right, so now you know what the yard is. Verse 73, your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Here the psalmist proclaimed God as creator, that he understood certain obligations to God because he was made by the hands of God. He says, give me understanding. In his thoughts of God as creator, the psalmist prayed for understanding. He recognized that this was something often misunderstood. I want you to get this. One can ask for and expect help in understanding the Bible. Wow. Now, we know that there were a number of men used to write down the scripture. These men were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit worked through them. Now, he used the author's personality, background, life experiences, but the word still came from God. Right, that was done by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit took the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was a very educated, very learned man. Uh, in today's way of describing things, he would have been Dr. Paul with a earned doctor's degree in theology. Dr. Paul. He used Peter. Peter's title was fisherman. You read Peter, it's like a fisherman. 
Mary Paul, it's like a guy with a university education. God used both of them, worked through their personalities. The Holy Spirit told Paul what to write down. The Holy Spirit told Peter what to write down. When we get saved, Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. Right? If you got the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and you're trying to understand this very complicated passage that Dr. Paul wrote, you go back to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you live inside of me. You told Paul what to put down. I can't make sense out of this. Would you please explain this to me? Amen. And he will. Now, sometimes instantaneous understanding. Other times you're going to work it through for six months. But the Holy Spirit is going to help you and is going to give you the ability to understand the Bible. Yes, God would not have taken the time to write this book to us if he didn't mean and expect us to be able to understand it. There should be nothing in this book you can't understand. You, now, you may have to do some research. Uh, a lot of my Bible study here is I'll go back and I'll fill in cultural and religious details that you and I don't have. Uh, I will do this because we got lots of visitors who haven't heard this before. The folks who wrote the Bible wrote just like you would write. You don't waste words telling something to somebody they already know. So I'm going to pick on Maggie. I can do that, right? All right? So if I wrote Maggie a letter today and said, Maggie, do you remember where you were on 9-11? Maggie would know what I was talking about. She would remember the planes and the building and all that stuff. I didn't have to stop and give her all those details. It's a shared life experience. She knows exactly what I meant. Now, 3,000 years from now, somebody finds the letter I wrote Maggie. It says, do you remember where you were on 9-11? And they're going to say, why did he want to know where she was when she made an emergency phone call? Because they don't have that shared background that Maggie and I have. The Bible's like that. The Bible was written 2,000 to 6,000 years ago by people who didn't live in the United States, by people who farmed for a living, by people who had a very different culture and lifestyle and set of experiences than you and I do. It's been translated from the original tongue, where I believe it's without error, in the original tongue, the Bible is without error, it is infallible, it is perfect, but guys touched it. When guys touch stuff, they make mistakes. So, and on top of that, we don't have all that shared culture. So for us to get the real meaning, we gotta go back and say, okay, what, what was going on then? How do they live? What, 